Hi, welcome everyone. We'll just give it a minute and let everybody get in. That's looking good, people filing in. Welcome everyone, we're just gonna give it a minute. Okay, let's get started. Uh, welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today. My name is Shannon Gannon and I am the Global Education Director at Magnum Photos. And with my colleague Pauline Vermeer, Cultural Director at Magnum Photos New, New York, we will be your hosts for the Magnum uh, Beyond Magnum Talks program. It gives me great pleasure to introduce the president of Magnum Photos, Olivia Arthur, to officially launch the program and to tell us more about its conception and aims. Hi, Olivia, welcome. Thank you, Shannon. And hi, everyone. Um, well, it, I'm, I'm really happy to be here welcoming you all to this exciting program of talks uh, with so many really interesting voices and perspectives in it. it. It's been a huge pleasure personally for me to meet many of these contributors and, and hear so many insightful thoughts on our current debates. Now, this, this series doesn't come out of the blue. It's been in the pipeline for some time. It was initiated uh, back in the autumn when we started working on our archive review project. The number and breadth of the questions that were emerging from that project was growing and we began to realize as, as we brought outside opinions in to guide and challenge us that sharing what we were learning with the broader community would be helpful to everyone. So that's why we've decided to share it and make it open with all of you and I'm very happy to see lots of people here joining us. So I'm really grateful to all for the efforts that have gone into making this come together and grow from a series of conversations into these public talks. Thank you to all the contributors who've agreed to participate and particularly to the chapter heads who've stepped in and helped to shape and grow this into a really interesting series. There are many difficult conversations going on across our industry at the moment and a lot of important questions are being asked. I believe that many of us are taking a long hard look in the mirror and that is no bad thing. Journalistic and artistic freedom of expression are more important than ever and we're here to defend them. But we also want to do that with thought and with understanding of the issues being raised. And that is why we want to use Beyond Magnum to open up some of these debates and to try and understand more and share what we're learning as we go along. Of course, there are endless questions and there will be topics that we've missed, but I hope you will find it to be a wholesome program. When these debates started happening at Magnum, we were thinking about the archive in the past, looking backwards to what had been done. But it's so important that we go in both directions with this to understand the past, but also to think about our current practices and where the medium is going to go, and where it will take us in the years ahead. Things are moving incredibly fast, driven by greater consciousness of the issues, changing societal norms and new publishing technologies, which shift the landscape in fundamental ways. Trying to second guess the future and technologies that might come along would be impossible. But thinking about the possibilities can anyway help us help to move us forward in a thoughtful way and with our eyes open. One of the things that I believe has come further to the front of our thinking about documentary photography is the way that it connects the subjects of photographs with their audiences. Whether it's a New York Times or a National Geographic image from the past or a selfie uploaded to Instagram, thinking about the act of photographing in terms of this connection helps us to understand some of those questions better. So if we think of the readers of that magazine or newspaper transported to the village they're looking at, Similarly, we think of the global audience on Instagram as transported to the bedrooms or intimacy of the teenager uploading that selfie. And there is plenty more in between and beyond. And what about the practitioner? What is his or her role in making that connection between these elements? What responsibilities should they bear in mind and how do, how do they share those responsibilities with the people who publish and distribute those images? There is a power dynamic that's inherent to the photographic act, no matter who the subjects are. If I photograph my husband or my mother, 
I still end up being the one with the image that I can take away and do more or less what I like with. And that puts me in a position of power. So if there are other imbalances between myself and my subject, that power becomes even more. I personally hope that I don't misuse that power, but I also don't believe that we can get rid of it. It's important to have it in my mind and to think about it and about why I want to connect an audience to those subjects. So coming back to the archive, I think the, that the act of seeing our archive, not just as a library, but also as a tool for making those connections between audiences and the people in the photographs, as well as distributing images globally, has helped us to understand this power and think about it in new ways. The first chapter of Beyond Magnum will be dedicated to archives, the content, use and impact of photographic archives. I'm extremely grateful to Azu Wabugu and Asya Yagmurian for taking, the, taking on the role of curating and chairing this chapter, and they will take us through a series of case studies from and beyond the Magnum archive. In this, they will be looking at issues including ownership, presentation and access, and answer some of the difficult questions around historic archives. The second chapter will be on representation and self-representation and will be chaired by Noel Flores Teard and Anthony Luvera. It will examine some of the vital questions facing the photographic industry today and the role of representation in them, questioning the power dynamics at play between who is represented and who is control in control of this representation. The third and final chapter will look forward to the future of, of photography, chaired by Fred Richin and Zara Russell these talks will examine what role photography can play in a new digital post-truth world and whether we're facing a renaissance in imagery or a dystopia. I'm really looking forward to hearing all of these talks and I know that I have a lot to learn from them. They're also being recorded and so if you miss something that you'd like to attend there'll be an opportunity to come back to it. So back to today's session. I'd like to thank Azul and Asya again for all their work and for taking the time to come and present their thoughts ahead of the series today. I would also like to, to thank Shannon Gannam and Pauline Vermeer and the Archive Review Committee for all the efforts that they have put in and for the long journey that it's been to get here. So on this incredibly important topic of the photographic archive, shortly over to Azul and Asya after some housekeeping notes from Shannon. Thank you very much. Thank you, Olivia. Thanks so much. Uh, so today's event is being hosted via Zoom webinar, and if you're not familiar with it, uh, you'll be able to participate via the Q&A box. Please put in any comments that you have for us, uh, questions for our speakers, or logistical questions. Uh, we'll try to address as many as we can, either live or with a text response, uh, but given the time, we're probably not going to be able to address everything. We will, however, collate these and look at ways that we can build these into our reflections at the end of each chapter. Uh, we recognize that this series of events will likely raise more questions than answer them, and that's the point, the point, and that it is the beginning of a conversation. So thank you so much for your contributions to that dialogue. Uh, with that, I will hand over to Pauline to say a few words and introduce our co-chairs. Um, and with that, I'll ask Azu and Azia to, to join us. Thank you, Shannon. Um, it is a pleasure to, to be here with you all. And thank you so much to the audience for being here. Um, this is really, um, this was an exercise that we wanted to make for, for that exactly, to open up the conversation, to have you all here, to talk about very important subject matters, but also very interesting subject matters in the field. And we hope that you will enjoy those conversations. And yeah, we're very grateful to be able to, to organize this series. And we're incredibly grateful to um, Azu Wagbogu, uh, Wabogu and Asia Yagmorian for hosting this first chapter on archives and for framing this, um, this thematic that is very wide. We recognize it's a deep and wide subject and a deeply interesting one. And we're very grateful to you, Azu and Asia, that you accepted to be our host today and for the two days to come. So I'm gonna introduce you both and then look forward to the conversation. Um, so thank you so much. Azu Wabogu is the founder and director of African Artists Foundation, a non-profit organization based in Lagos, Nigeria. Um, Wabogu was elected as the interim director, head curator at the Zeitz Museum of Contemporary Art in South Africa from June 28 to August 2019. He also serves as founder and director of uh, Lagos Photo Festival, Photo Festival and annual international arts festival of photography held in Lagos. 
He's the creator of Art Base Africa, a virtual space to discover and learn about contemporary African art. Azua Bogu served as a juror for the Dutch Doc Pop Cap Photography Award, the WordPress Photo Prisma Photography Award in 2015, Greenpeace Photo Award, New York Times Photo Portfolio Reviews, Eugene Smith Award, Photo España, Form Award, Welcome Photography Prize, and is a regular juror for organizations such as Lens Culture and Magnum. For the past 20 years, he has curated private collections for various prominent individuals and corporate organizations in Africa. Wabogu obtained a master's in public health from the University of Cambridge. He lives and works in Lagos, Nigeria. Thank you, Azu. Asia Yagmorian is a curator who lives in Berlin. She holds an MA in journalism and is currently pursuing a master's in curatorial studies at the Academy of Fine Arts Leipzig. In 2016, she co-founded and curate, uh, curated sorry, Armenia's first design pavilion. She has worked for international media and on art projects such as the Dilijan Arts Observatory 2016 and Portable Homelands from Field to Factory for the exhibition Hello World Revisi Revisiting a Collection at Hamburger Bahnhof Museum für Gegenwart 2018. More recently, Yagmorian was part of the curatorial team of the 33rd edition of the Ljubljana Biennale of Graphic Arts. She curated the Pickle Bar with Slavs and Tatars in collaboration with KW Institute for Contemporary Art and was a guest curator of homemuseum.net for the Lagos Photo 20. She also works as an editor of art publications. Asia and Azu, I will let you um, introduce us to, our, to your guest, and we very much look forward to the conversation. Thank you all. Hello. Thank you. Thank you, Shannon, Olivia, and Pauline. And big thank you to the whole Magnum team for the invitation. This is a really important learning point for all of us, and we are grateful for this opportunity to learn and to share. As Pauline has already mentioned, yes, we have met with Azo Noagbogo in 2017 in Berlin, as we were both working on the exhibition in Hamburger Bahnhof called Hello World Revising a Collection, a 13 chapter exhibition, a critical inquiry into the collections of the National Gallery of Contemporary Art and its predominantly Western focus. In 2020, I was invited as a guest curator for the last edition of Lagos Photo called Home Museum, which was an attempt to create an unpolluted living photography archive of the personal collections and the consent by the co-creators from all over the world. So welcome to chapter one. Let me introduce you to our statement. With this chapter, we aim to explore the potentiality of the photographic archive through a series of case studies around and beyond the Magnum Archive. Through those case studies, we aim to identify and reflect on the common problematics linked to the nature of the archives. Each presentation will be followed by a discussion between the presenters, moderator, and the guests. These case studies will include a personal photographic archive found in the suitcase of a Nigerian artist, Emmanuel Adewale Oyeunga, the analysis of a photographic documents relating to the anti-colonial malign emergency and the transition of the Ernst Coles archive to Magnum photos. All these discussions will unveil a number of sensitive questions related to the archives, issues of ethics, ownership and access. In each case, the speaker will seek for answers from the perspective of both vulnerability and strength. We will ask, how can we use storytelling as a strategy of working with archive? How can found photographs become the testimonial of a looted legacy? Or how can the relocation or the destruction of an archive repropose its meaning? And what can be learned from the artists when we look beyond? Azum, what do you think? Our mutual interest in the archive comes from the interest in the future of museology and collections. Why do images matter? What can we learn from the past and how can we use them today? Thank you. Thank you very much, Azia, for your question. And uh, thank you to uh, Magnum for this brilliant initiative that is very bold and not dissimilar to what we did with Hello World, where the museum uh, in the Hamburger Bahnhof, where the museum itself 
was vulnerable and willing to interrogate its, co its collection and how um, the gaps in its collection. And so when you think about the archive, the archive is really about, it's photography has always been about truth or the interminable search for truth, the quest for what is real and and the uh, uh, magnum sits at a pinnacle of this sort of uh, repository of truth. And, uh, and the archive is meant to represent the historical um, bank, if you like, or library or museum of these truths, the aggregation of truths. And the question is, how did we get there? Or how do we get there? Who are the activists? Who are the players in creating the truths of the world? Um, the image that you have on your screen is um, actually uh, one part of a three-part uh, triptych by um, the artist photographer Alfredo Ja, where he um, created a conceptual work based on over 2,500 covers of Life magazine. And um, Life magazine, um, more or less, you could say, um, you could argue is uh, the inventor, if you like, of photojournalism. You know, in 18, I believe 87, it was launched. But between 1936 and um, 1996, Alfredo collect, collated in sequence, in chronological order, these covers. And Life Magazine's motor was, um, mission was to bring the world to your doorstep, right? And in, in that whole period, there are five covers that represent Africa. And of these five covers, it's um, a representation of animals, disease, and um, displacement. And this sort of idea begins to, makes you begin to understand the role of images in shaping ideology, the role of images in shaping cosmology. And uh, images are never innocent. In this, images are very, very politically charged. And when we think about the, con the conception of this conversation today, tonight, and what an archive represents, and who is archiving, and who is shaping the way the world sees the, itself, um, it becomes a terribly important responsibility. That means that we need to have a, lot, a number of markers to be able to really say that we are bringing the world or we are archiving and we're creating an artifact of the world through visual culture. And it's not, it's not just about um, diversity, it's not just about the majority world country or the Western world, it's also about gender, it's also about um, styles, it's also about approach. Um, and we'll touch on all of these topics later on um, as we begin to delve into the issue of archives. Um, I'm super excited about this and I think um, the way these talks have been curated, especially in this first chapter, really gives us a good depart point of departure to engage with these very seminal topics. So what we're dealing is uh, with is contentious material. So how do we handle it? Like, do we reject it? Do we reformulate it? Do we pretend it never existed? What is the ethics of the representation What's it about what about the embedded embedded hierarchical structures of the archives with a certain colonial approach to photography? Is there any chance to improve this? Would you would you like to walk us through the program of the first chapter and maybe to answer some of these questions? Sure. Um, I think the way we've structured these, especially these archival conversations, allow us to explore various innovative approaches to, in approach to dealing with these contentious material. In my view, um, censorship is the biggest sin in when you're dealing with culture. So I believe that um, the artists and the photographers that we're going to be in conversation with um, offer us a diversity of approach to dealing with these um, very, very difficult problematic conversations. Um, we, we start obviously with the case of Prince Emmanuel Adewale Oyenuga and Anna and Anna Briangas and Dr. Carmen Perez Gonzalez, Maurice Naimola, a good friend, who have all contributed in helping us create or understand 
um, the archive of Prince Emmanuel Ademale Oyenuga. I don't know, we'll get into that later on. And that's the first case study. Um, the, the second case study is the um, writing the history of the um, Manayan and um, emergency with the work of Sim Chinyin. And it will be moderated by Wayne Modesto. Wayne is also in a position that is super interesting because he has inherited a, a, a very difficult old institution in the Netherlands. And in his role as, um, as uh, an African black intellectual working in this very difficult space, charged with um, reformulating the future of a very, very um, unwieldy institution, he's going to be able to deal with these issues and you know have a conversation with um, um, Sim Chinyin about these. So I think that will be a really exciting conversation. Um, we will also talk about NS Cole's archive. Um, and we're going to be able to speak about the ethics and morality and the, the legality in visual culture. I mean, today we charge and we expect artists to be puritanical, to display all of their tricks, to lay them before the audience and to be moralist and to be beyond reproach. And I think we're going to be able to have a uh, a useful conversation about the distinction between photojournalism and what is recorded the ethics of the profession and um, what an artist can do with the uh, artistic freedom and how that enables us to understand contentious, difficult material a bit better. Um, we're also going to be able to jump into, we're talking about dealing with archives, um, the brilliant, what happens when eight women artists, photographers go on a well-trodden path and revisit a famous archive, the Ingo Marat um, um, archive with uh, Olivia Arthur and her team going around, uh, traveling along Dany River, um, like missionaries basically, organizing workshops, seminars, engaging with NGOs, engaging with institutions, and really allowing us to we exhume, resuscitate, and we imagine a very well-known archive and we begin to think about it in, in a different way. And then um, we also have the, the fifth uh, case study where we deal with the work of Christina de Midel and Rafael Milak. And with this, I think it's going to be a really, really interesting conversation with Christina's approach where, for example, she's able to, um, if as she likes to tell us, if you were to talk about the, the story of prostitution today and you were looking visually through the internet or you're going through libraries or archives, it's just pictures of women in various poses um, in the, you know, trying to get money for in the sex trade. No, there's so little material around the other players or the other gender involved in, in um, in the sex trade. Uh, Christina's work um, will deal with that. She also deals with um, the, uh, through the work party, she's also able to make us reimagine what it means to have a redaction of text and image and the juxtaposition, how you create new meaning through um, juxtaposition of text redacted and image. And I think that's also a really wonderful um, we are dealing with the very important archive. As we know, the chairman Mao produced that book, um, Party, and distributed over a billion copies of that, of, of, um, of his um, Communist Manifesto. And so, I mean, there are so many diverse ways of dealing with the archive, and Christina and Rafael, where Rafael uses a very sort of aesthetically strong, visually stimulating methodology to talk about politics in, in his country and in, in the region. Um, and of course, we're going to be able to imagine how aesthetics shape the creation of, and the accumulation of visual archives throughout history. Um, so yeah, there's a, a, a lot to get through, five case studies. And I think through using case studies, we begin to begin to, oh, sorry, we, we begin to unpack and understand the problematics, the intractability, the ethics, the, the collaborative nature the blind spots, the things that we can know and the things that we might not know when we're dealing with these contentious issues. Thank you, Azo. So as you've already said, for the first discussion, which will happen today, 
we would like to share with you a story, a project that we have encountered recently and to share something in a way personal that we are also dealing with. It's a story of a found suitcase which belongs to a Nigerian artist, uh, Emanuele Oeunga, that stayed in the cellar of Briongo's family in Barcelona for almost a half of a century. And we would like to invite all of you to join us on this journey of discovery and probably to try to identify or to try to trace back the pitfalls, the underwater stones, which reoccur like a pattern in our collective perception when it comes with the work with the archives. So in this case study, we would like to talk about the found archives and how does one deal with them? We think that it's also an important question, even if we talk about the individual's archives, individual archives of the Magnum photographers, which already passed away. We would like to point out on some, on something personal, a collection of the individual assembled by the artist and how this case can become a seed, a microcosm of something much bigger and broader and how one can see the history of a people or a continent just through a found object. This case might remind us of a case of a Mexican suitcase, which tells a story over 4,000 film negatives that span the course of a Spanish civil war. The found material was photographed by David Semmer, Gerda Taro, and Robert Capa. Uh, the material found also reveals the broader subject of a political situation in the country the struggle of the leftist intellectuals during the war and is an example of the work of a free photographers which laid a foundation for modern war photojournalism. Uh, for this, I would like to talk about, about the something that uh, interests me a lot recently and I've been talking about this with us as well. There is a huge expectation that artists, photojournalists, are held to very high moral standards. But why can we place high moral demands on the artists just as we do on the photographers and expect them to be moralistic? And if that is the case, what kind of work will we have to do today in the domain of a meaning making through art and photography? Um, there is a number of people who blur the line between the photographer and the artist. How does it that influence the perception of the material? As a, what do you think? Is that distinction actually needed? The, the distinction is very much important in terms of publishing because photography works um, and the dynamics of photography and image reading comes in. We are, we are hardwired to be storytellers. And so when you see an image and you see another image, you anticipate the next image where we want to tell a story. And that's why images um, are incredibly um, important, as I say, in shaping identity, in shaping ideology, in shaping cosmology. And, um, but at the same time, um, it's a very difficult problem to begin to um, merge artistic practice with photo documentary practice and expect that um, um, you can always present them in the same way. I think there, there needs there need to be a kind of distinction in such a regard and um, in the reading and understanding because obviously the ethics and the responsibility of in photojournalism must be different in the reading in the, in the art world. I mean, the artist is only required, it's mostly required to spark a feeling in you in it, it, it worked uh, in a more Kantian way, you know. But um, with photojournalism, it's really, really important, especially in the post-truth society, that we are held to the highest standards of of um, of um, ethics and um, and fact checking at the rest of it. But again, there are you know, it's like if, uh, how do you bring a story that is that has been buried. That is unknown. How do you bring it back to life when we talk about the archive? Um, the dynamism that you approach, that you use in bringing it to life, for example, what Christina de Medel has done with the Afrina story, or what um, Sadia Hatman has done with um, her, her recent seminal work 
um, wayward lives, beautiful experiments. It gives you various dynamics and examples of what you can do with an archive. I don't think you can really have a hard and fast rule about these things. But again, with the suitcase, with um, uh, Barcelona suitcase, our own version of Barcelona suitcase, which will be the the spine for Lagos Photo 2021, I believe we can begin to tackle these important conversations because Prince Adewale Emmanuel Yanuga was trained from my understanding of what we found as a, as, a, as a photographer before he went to art school. And in his role as a photographer, he was part of Paramount Photo Studio, which was seen to be a sort of a repository of facts working with studio photography, but also working as photojournalist in, in West Africa. And so they were part of a network of photojournalists in, in the region that really, really had a vital role to play in bringing war photography, reportage, um, documentary news to the rest of the world. So when we get into it with the help of Moritz, Anna, Carmen, I think we're going to get um, a bit closer to the truth of the answer of the question that you asked. Thank you. So should we begin with the um, present with our first study case? Yes, why not? Should we, shall we invite Moritz and Co into the conversation? That would be great. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody got in. Welcome. Back to you guys, thank you. Carmen, Moritz, Anna. Hello. So, <laughs> hi everyone, nice to see you. So, um, with a presentation that I will share soon and we will walk you through, we were trying to follow the logic of the suitcase, the functionality and the utilization of the object in its direct say, sense, just taking things out without, but not treating as your own belongings, not interrogating into this system of the collection created by the artist. So we try to think of a found object as already existing collection. And uh, I would like to introduce to you Anna Briongos, who is a writer and the custodian of the suitcase. Anna studied literature at Tehran University and worked in Iran and Afghanistan as a consultant and interpreter for nearly 10 years. Being a former professor, Anna uses her comprehensive knowledge of the Islamic world for her current writings and lectures on her and her experience of an educator in the countries she knows best, Iran, Afghanistan, and India. Anna also worked as a volunteer teacher at Bayat al Takafa, a nonprofit organization for immigrants. Carmen Perez Gonzalez is a freelance photography historian, lecturer, and curator based in Germany. After finishing her studies at Barcelona University, she undertook a two year and a half long trip overall overland through Asia from Turkey to China and published afterwards several photographic portfolios and the catalog of a solo exhibition of her photographs of women workers in Asia. She has worked as an exhibition manager and curator at the Science Museum in Barcelona at the Museum for East Asian Art in Cologne and as a guest curator for different museums in Asia and USA. She wrote her PhD thesis on the 19th century local Iranian photography and published the book Local Portraiture Through the Lens of the 19th Century Iranian Photography in 2012. She worked as a postdoc researcher and lecturer at Bupartal University from 2014 to 2019, and edited a book on moon cartography and photography entitled Celine's Two Faces, from 17th century drawings to spacecraft imaging in 2018. Moritz Neumüller is a curator, educator, and writer in the field of photography and new media. He has worked in research and management positions for international institutions such as the Museum of Modern Art in New York, La Fabrica in Madrid, and Photo Island in Dublin. He is currently chief curator of the Photo Book Week Arus Denmark. Since, since 2010, he runs the Curatorship, a platform that provides useful information 
for visual artists. At the same time, he studied the project Arte Contacto to improve the access to arts and culture. From 2016 to 2019, Neumüller was the communication manager of the award-winning EU project Arches. So let me share my screen. And to move with the... So, uh, as uh, well, Pauline has already mentioned in the introduction, um, uh, I was a guest curator for the last edition of the Lagos photo called Home Museum, uh, where we try to create an imaginary space of a museum which deals with the collections without actually owning them. Uh, and we, we started this initiative for sending an open letter to a friend translated into 12 languages. The result of the open call sent and this initiative turned out in the website, which has no intention to categorize or to look at the objects in isolation or to treat them separate from each other. And um, funny enough, after doing this project, a couple of months later, we have, Azu has received a letter from Anna Priongos. So I'll pass the mic to Anna to tell us the story that she presented to Azu in January 2020. Hello to everyone. Uh, thank you, Asia. Thank you, Magnum. Uh, this is the story of a suitcase full of letters, clothes, pencils, drawings, and even a sword belonging to a Nigerian photographer and artist who was living in Barcelona in the 60s of the last century. This artist was attending the classes of an art school and he was known as Prince. Emmanuel Adewale Oyenuga. At that school, uh, he met uh, my mother, who was in her 50s, and she invited him to our home very often. Uh, when, uh, when he uh, left, uh, moved to London, um, search in search for of a better life, um, he left uh, a suitcase uh, full of his belongings to my mother and he asked her to uh, take care of it. Uh, this suitcase uh, was uh, taken into a room uh, where useless things were kept and nobody remembered about it because we didn't receive any news from uh, Emmanuel Oyenuga. So when my mother was very old, for after 40 years, um, we decided to take her close to us. And we had to get rid of the useless things she had in her home. So uh, we found the suitcase and, and we decided to open it. Uh, um, then all the photograph of the photos of many other things. I wanted to give it back to the owner. So she started 
writing letters uh, to all the addresses she found in the envelopes of the letters, and uh, she, she never received any any answer. Uh, then uh, she was uh, 99 years old, and I kept the suitcase do with it, but the, uh, I wanted to give it back to the owner because my mother asked me to do it. So uh, I uh, talked to um, uh, the director of a, uh, or of a foundation in Barcelona, uh, Colectania, and they give me uh, the address, email address of ASU. And I wrote an email to ASU. And ASU uh, um, answered very quickly, and he was very excited about it. I was so happy. Then, uh, since to find the family because uh, this, uh, in this suitcase uh, there is the history and the soul of a Nigerian family. And the first person to whom I talked about this was my friend uh, Carmen Perez Gonzalez uh, because she is the, on, the only person I know uh, um, working in in photography, and I sent her the some of the photography of, of the pictures uh, through my smartphone, and she uh, told me that it was an important archive. So uh, she started working on it, and uh, uh, now I would like. Uh, Carmen to talk about uh, this, this archive. So Carmen, it's your turn. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you, Anna. And thank you, Atu, and Asia and Mahmoud. Yes, uh, when I got the material from Anna, I became like everybody else, very excited. And um, well, I was really jumping around the house. But at the same time, um, I talk with I talk with Anna, and, and, and we share a concern. I mean, important the most important thing, the priority is to find this family. And uh, so after discussing a little bit, and we decide that Anna would write letters again to all the uh, family, all the addresses. And in the meanwhile, because that was at the beginning of uh, last summer, um, then um, I will start researching a little bit about uh, Nigerian photography because that's not my topic at all, but I'm very interested on uh, local photography. So that was for me also very exciting. So I, I just start researching and everything, but I will start with what we find with the, the, the end. And that's what you are seeing on the screen. This is basically what we have uh, got so far after sitting on, the, on this collection, on this family photo collection for several months. Um, what Anna got, um, her mother and Anna later, is a family photo collection of around 400 photographs. And it has been organized in, um, kept, and she didn't, they didn't, uh, polluted at all, so it's kept like it was given. And the material is um, divided in different uh, parcels and albums. One brown envelope, brown portfolio, green album, turquoise album, loose photographs, color slides, medium format, and 35 uh, millimeters negative. So really interesting material from technique also. And from the beginning, for us was very important this photographic activity that we could find, that we could read of uh, in this collection. So one very important point from the beginning was to find all the photo studios 
and we managed to locate, to find uh, 13 of them, most of them in Lagos, but also in other cities like Ibadan and uh, also in Barcelona. After, um, and um, also for us was important the uh, photographic activity of Emmanuel, because he was a photographer. Anyhow, when we found the studios, we have addresses and everything, so I thought, let's locate them, uh, let's find the addresses in Google Maps. But we tried to find them in Google Maps, and some of them were not to be found. I mean, they, they changed addresses. So um, we, we had the idea, let's search for a map of Lagos in 1970 and try to find the addresses. And it was a success. We were all very happy because we were able to locate three very important uh, studios from this collection. And it was a really walking distance from Emmanuel home. What we also found is that this Facun's photo that you can read on the screen, it was uh, the studio where Emmanuel was working actually as a photographer. Now we will see a little bit of this material. For example, we found from Paramount Photographers, which uh, is actually now well known for the people in the field. And Facun's photo was very important thing also for us because uh, when Anna showed me the material and I started, um, we, we we were asking ourselves, there is a, a studio which is repeating itself all the time because it has the same floor. And at the end, Anna found uh, the, in the back of one of the photos that it was Facon's photo where Emmanuel was working. Maybe next slide. Yeah, that's also examples of other, um, other studios, Paradise Photo Studio, the Wall Studio, Paramount's photographers, of course, because it was the first one. So I started researching about it. Uh, and well, I found this small article, which I thought it was very interesting because um, according to this article in the late 90s, Andre Magnin bought several hundred photographs from Mama J, the daughter of Paramount's photographers. So it was an interesting thing that we could follow. Yeah, just as an example of what we have done so far. What for me was very important is when the, I found an article which is uh, from the pioneer uh, research in uh, Yoruba photography. Yoruba photography itself, not Nigerian photography, so Yoruba, exactly what we needed. And that's uh, written in 1978. And for me, it was enlightening because uh, it, it, uh, it was written very interesting, important um, comments on. Uh, the local photography put into its proper context, cultural context. Uh, could we go to the other one? The first one, please? No. Yeah. Mm, the other one? One more back. Back. Yeah. And then now? Yeah. A little bit uh, more advanced. More advanced. One more. One more. Sorry about this. One more. No, no, the other direction. <laughs> Again, the other direction. A little bit more here. So uh, this is um, one of the things that uh, he brought is as the most fascinating and well, well, he talked about the thing that the fact that photographs bear some spirituality, some um, important things for the people. And uh, he brought that the most fascinating and widespread example in the integration of photography into the traditional beliefs and rituals are twins. Because twins are sacred children with connections to the spirit world. Is it especially important to show them proper respect? What we found in the collection is that we have a lot of twins. So um, that was also a very interesting point. Parker? Yeah, that was it. And now I think it's Athu yeah, that uh, should talk a little bit about studio photography. Thank you, thank you, Carmen. That was brilliant. Um, that was really enlightening to hear. Um, just to throw back to the first very, the very first slide where we had the open call inviting citizens because the, the one of the incredible things about photography. It's its ability to remediate and illuminate any condition or any situation that we are faced with. And um, when I left the Zeitzmoker Museum in South Africa, um, 
I started thinking about the ways in which um, contemporary contemporary art and contemporary photography and contemporary visual culture in Chile um, is sort of almost aping colonial style um, collecting or on the hierarchy there and the problems that are inherent within this. And the and one of the things that the museum um, was very firm on was that you know the the they they said to me that this is a museum interested in 21st century 21st century um, art. And that is to say only interested in everything that starts from 20, 2000, from the year 2000. I thought, wow, how does the museum reject an entire period? And how do you move forward without actually establishing the ballast, the foundation, the history of where we, how we got here? And this contemporary um, anxiety to always be current and the rejection of the past and the learning from the past and so that moved uh, my interest into the topic, the urgent burning topic of restitution and reparations. And I thought, well, if photography has this magical power to remediate contentious situations, what can we learn? And how can photography break these hierarchies and begin to almost give people, um, citizens, the power to begin to own their own narrative and begin to care about their own um, heritage? And so when we did design the open call, we said, we asked um, citizens from all over the world to photograph between six to 12 objects that held a particular emotive um, appeal to them. It wasn't, we said, imagine if you're traveling away to another continent, and I said, you don't need to pack anything, pack, pack only six to 12 objects in a tiny suitcase that you need. And you have enough money to, um, we have enough money to buy clothes and whatever else you need. We just want you to pack objects that have what we call objects of virtue, objects with an emotional, sentimental, if you like, mystical, emotional attachment to. It could be a pair of shoes, it could be a pair of sunglasses, or your, your reading glasses, or a bar of soap that your grandfather gave to you, or something. Whatever it is, or something you share with your twin sister, whatever it is, photograph it and send it to us and we, as we build the home museum. The idea was to push back the, the topic of restitution back to the people and to give um, citizens the responsibility to not wait for the relic diplomacy that is going on between governments and to give us the power. And that led to um, the, and the similitude between that and Prince Adewalo Yenuga's suitcase is very obvious to see. The objects that he kept and he held there, the way he ordered his collection. Um, because of the lockdown, we weren't able to actually, I haven't been able to actually go out there, nor, neither have Asia. And luckily I have a friend in Barcelona, Norris Mola, and I called Moritz and I said, look, I have a situation in Barcelona. I'd like for you to help me out. And Maurice was like a champion. He went out there. He met with Anna. He went out with um, Veronica, his colleague and assistant. And they were able to scan and document all of these images that we are looking at now. Um, before Maurice speaks, I also wanted to share very importantly the, the a touch on the point that um, Carmen raised about the role of photographing twins and again, and the way the similitude and parallels with the ubiquitous Ibeji dolls. And if you look at the, uh, when we talk about restitution and reparations and returns, Ibeji dolls are one of the most sought after objects. And as you can see in this, um, the way Yoruba photography worked, it was very important to be able twins for whatever reason, that is still quite very difficult to understand uh, um, the highest prevalence of, of twins global in the world is in um, Europe, a part of West Africa. And some people say due to the diet of yams or something, but uh, twins hold a very sacred and special place in the, in the way the, the, the people think about history and heritage and, and the way they shape and, and uh, have an understanding of their place and their role in the world. And photography has became the um, replacement of these Ibeji dolls in the way they articulated these, uh, these um, 
a sort of um, spiritual or cosmological guide and you know the way they sort of relate in space and time in in, in the world um, and then through these important archives we're able to understand a little bit more about the history of studio photography in Africa and studio photography played an incredible role for the rest of the world maybe not necessarily for Africans in understanding modernity in Africa and there's been a lot of uh, essays and a lot of conversations around it and a lot of curators have really promoted the uh, Malik Sidi Bey, the Mamakasa, the Seydou Keita, the Soi Sameis, who um, for most people living that period didn't think these images were extraordinary because um, in each street, in each neighborhood, there was a studio photographer who um, had a space where citizens were able to engage and have a dialogical um, relationship through images with the photographer and that dialogue was a sort of spiritual consultation if you like and through that consultation the if you're celebrating your birthday or or the birth of a child you know you'd have a dialogue with the photographer and you'd say look you know i think this guy's going to be a scientist i want you to create the backdrop of a scientist and they'll create stethoscopes or they'll create a they'll have a backdrop with the a microscope or a science lab. I don't have the sort of stage photography there. So it was a very important space for the imaginary and a very important space for um, for West African citizens and you know and it and not just West African. All of Africa was a very very powerful space for that sort of spiritual, material, culture engagement in visual um, thinking. Um, I'm going to stop right now and allow Maurice to tell us a little bit more about his experience working with uh, Anna and Simon and in unearthing and helping us understand a little bit more about the archive that we're that we're discussing. Maurice, over to you, please. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for inviting me. Um, and um, yeah, let's go straight into it. Uh, when Azu uh, gave me this wonderful message and the opportunity that um, we could be part of this journey. Uh, we didn't hesitate very long and uh, Veronica Los, Los Santos and myself, we went to uh, Anna's house and um, yeah, we opened the suitcase with her. Um, of course, the suitcase was already open and uh, she had, um, as we now already know, um, looked into it but we tried to photograph it in a uh, systematic way. And, um, and we found these different things that uh, Anna has already mentioned, which uh, if you want to go to the next slide, were uh, books, there were records, there were diaries, um, sketches, uh, artworks, other ephemery, uh, ephemera, which included a sword, pencils, which you can see here, um, and um, yeah, letters, uh, many letters and here diaries. So um, we tried to respect completely, of course, the structure of the archive itself or the collection or whatever we want to call it, suitcase structure. Um, and everything we took out to photograph, we tried to put up, put back in exactly the same place. We also had to invent ourselves some categories. You have seen some uh, in Carmen's, I think, first slide or second slide when you uh, saw these uh, this mind map. Um, maybe yeah, you you are already looking for it. There we go. No, you here on the left hand side. You can see brown envelope, brown portfolio, and so on. These were um, <laughs> names that I made up on the fly. I, I was <laughs> never expecting them to come up in an, any talk here and, um, and to be like public. It was just a way of uh, reminding us where to um, where we found that and where it has to go back after photographing it. And of course, um, some of these, um, uh, of these uh, categories have a very spatial, very material uh, touch. No? So loose photographs, of course, is something very different to an album or a portfolio. 
We saw parts of the Brown portfolio already. Um, maybe I think it's number 14 of your slides. This one, yeah, here you can see, these are these nearly A3 sheets um, that are inside a Brown portfolio and uh, which we took out. Uh, and uh, here you have the twins. I just wanted to add just one footnote to what Azu and Carmen said uh, about the representation of twins. For me, as I think nearly everybody in this project, it's kind of a magical and uh, very personal. I've never been to Nigeria, but um, I lived in uh, Cuba and did a project on Cuban, um, on the, in, on the Afri African heritage in Cuba. And, uh, and of course, the uh, Ibeyes, as they are called, in Cuba, really important there. And now, uh, of course, I mean, they uh, was just, um, you know, uh, that was 20 years ago. So um, it was really interesting for me that uh, the spirits, they tracked me down here and, um, and wanted me to have another look at that. And um, when we had another look um, together with Carmen, um, we found that there is also a kind of a representation categories, at least three that we found for how to how to represent twins or two people. Maybe they are not even twins, but they are two people on a photograph, can be friends or can be uh, brother and sister. And so we found out one, uh, which is oneness, no? this kind of holding the hands and becoming one um, together, one unity, let's say. Uh, you can see that here uh, where it says oneness, no? this one uh, picture, and then beside it we found one that we called mirroring, which was because they were kind of doing the same, but in a, in a, in a mirrored um, position. Like these two friends, they nearly have the same position of the legs and the hands and the, and the, and the heads, but uh, in the two different directions. And the, and the third one was doubling, which is nearly as if you cut and paste them twice the same person. So these, uh, maybe we find some more, but um, these are these kind of little um, outcomes already of the research in a very visual, very um, observational way. But maybe we go um, back down to uh, the records. And uh, the records, for example, here you see now this book and the record, it can, uh, it's a bit hard to read here, but I will uh, try to summarize. This is a book about wonderful, a uh, colorful world of birds that was given to uh, Emmanuel when he parted and it was given by um, his Nigerian friends. So this is kind of uh, pasted into the book. And of course he took the book, it's quite a thick book, so it must have been very heavy to take along. But of course he took this bird book along. And I think he also did some copies of some of the sketches that he did in art school from that book. And on the right hand side, you can see one, uh, two uh, of many records where you can maybe um, see it if you look close enough on the right, uh, the Pith of Soul, number two, on the very bottom right, you can see a signature, which you can also find again in the face of the singer on the left, um, on the left uh, record. So it's a quite um, strong, let's say, um, act of uh, appropriation of these records, I mean, no, assigning them in the face of the singer that, um, you know, that if they uh, borrowed to somebody or, you know, he would live, he lived in a student, in a student home. So uh, is, if you have anybody has ever lived in a student home, you probably know how quickly things disappear there, especially rec records and stuff like this. So he wanted to make sure that uh, these objects are recognized as him. His, sorry. And if you go to the next slide, you can see this also um, with his pencils, for example. No, here he signed uh, the pencils, Prince, uh, I guess that's uh, Prince Adevale, no? He's not Prince Emmanuel, but Prince Adevale uh, Oyenuga. And, uh, and these stamps that you can see, they were probably exercises that he had to do at the art school. So he, this was an art and design school where he had to uh, do different things. And uh, so there is this, um, all this material, including here on the right, uh, a sheet of paper, or several sheets of paper where you have 
written in a typewriter with a typewriter, a Spanish grammar. So I go, you go, he goes, and so on uh, to learn Spanish. And uh, on the same page, on top with pencil, some uh, observations and reflections of uh, Emmanuel on the Nigerian constitution. So what the constitution uh, should contain or should not contain, it's a bit hard to see, of course, and to read. But maybe that's also OK, because one of the questions that we are, we have to think about when we um, work with this archive is um, where is the uh, frontier line between public and private, who is allowed to see that material and what part of that material, is this private material, can that be shared with the public or should we keep this to ourselves? To ourselves, uh, just as custodians together with Anna, um, documenting it in a certain way uh, before it hopefully goes back to the family of Emmanuel or himself, if he's still alive, which I don't think, uh, is very probable, but maybe his family. And we have to think about, um, yeah, who is in control, of course, of this material, um, how we document it, and um, what we include. Here you have, um, for example, a, a diary, or it's, it's kind of a calendar, a pocket calendar from 1964 uh, from Lagos that he apparently took along. But uh, it's not only a calendar of 1964. He uses the calendar to, um, yeah, to, to write um, notes that sometimes have probably to do with the dates and sometimes not. And uh, I'll try to see it now here on my screen because um, I cannot see it really well on yours, what the note says here. So one is a, a note of, oh, perfect. Now this is a, seems to be uh, an address uh, taken from a, um, from an envelope and uh, here uh, on top it says um, a soap made by Baba Katem, Kat, uh, sorry, by Baba Ketiku is for good luck and uh, a, I cannot read this word, is for good luck too. Uh, 12th of September of uh, 68. Yeah, so you can see it is a very personal um, sometimes religious notes. Uh, there's also one or several prayer books that we found, which also have annotations. So uh, if you want to go to the next slide, I think there is uh, in this very calendar, a kind of a conversation where I think the part below where it says 23rd of March of 66, um, Emmanuel tells a story of a disgrace at the 83 Clegg Street, which was the um, address where his uh, parents-in-law, his uh, mother-in-law, father-in-law um, lived and they had um, a fight apparently. And, uh, and uh, he was saying here that he will never step near this house anymore. And, uh, and uh, above you can see a kind of response of somebody who found this note, maybe his wife or maybe another person. And you said, you are a bad boy. And there are several of these where we have this kind of uh, dialogue, uh, <laughs> very interesting, um, of course, and of course, very um, private also. So um, this, what we're doing here already exposing a very small part, of course, only, but um, is already, um, let's say, part of this very slim razor sharp line between the private and the public, where we have to take decisions, some of these decisions, we hope, help to find um, the owner. Um, and the others um, help us to understand better um, the material, this archive, if we can um, call it like this. So these questions, uh, if we find the owner or somebody who claims to be the owner and give back the suitcase, which is what Anna uh, in the very beginning has talked about that, that this is her wish because it was um, asked um, from her mother's side to do that. But there's also, of course, the scenario that we find more than one person who wants to, who claims the ownership of the archive. So how do we decide then from the material or from uh, uh, what these people tell to Anna or what happens if nobody um, 
can be found. So what will we do then? So how should we keep it? Should we digitize it? Uh, should we digitize it in, every, in any way? Because if it goes back then uh, to a family, then we only have digital copies, which of course, if, as Azu has said, uh, this should be part of Lagos photo, um, then we have to, um, yeah, to have at least a part of it in a digital way. And then we have the same problem as Magnum, I guess. We have to tag the material we have to uh, invent categories. We have to take decisions um, about what to show and what not to show and in which way. And um, yeah, so um, archiving, of course, in this way is not only about preserving, but it's also about what not to preserve, what not to record, what not to document, document or uh, as um, Didi Uberman would have said it, no? uh, to know uh, what not to do, uh, or um, um, or in Derrida's um, in Derrida's words, what to forget, right? So um, when we talk about archives, it's about the the, the uh, preservation of the past for the future, but it's also a very present time work of us working in the archive, and uh, and uh, there's a lot of decisions where we are just really not sure how to do it and what to do. And uh, there will be a lot of discussions, I think, and a lot of uh, different and very pleasing uh, the, um, yeah, conversations. So I thank again, um, uh, Azu and Asiat for inviting me to this conversation. I uh, thank you very much, Anna, and of course, Carmen for uh, sharing their work with us. And, uh, and uh, yeah, thank you for uh, allowing me to also put my uh, point of view here. Thank you, Moritz. I would also like to come back to one of the slides, which also talks about the discoveries which were made for the photographic material. And um, looking at the photography archives found in the suitcase, we noticed lots of the photographs which had marks on them and we were not understanding what it is about because they were very random made on a group of photographs um then on some of them we found our ip and um this is just another layer unfolded through the suitcase and through the photography material found in it this um, marks talk about they're possibly the casualties records of the Nigerian civil war, which, for example, I knew nothing about. Uh, and probably this is another subject that we can also think about and how we deal with this material. What do we do with it? Should I stop sharing? Yeah, photography and death, not a new subject, but still interesting. Maybe I just wanted to say that maybe we can comment about this Eric Animis and the, what we tried. Atuf, maybe you can. Before, oh, before you do that, Azu, sorry, I just wanted to jump in and just a reminder if anybody joined um, before, um, after the introduction, if you could put your questions into the Q&A box um, and we'll be answering some of those shortly. Sorry, Azu. Um, sorry, Karen, what was the question? I didn't quite hear you. I mean, it was uh, our, we tried to, in, in this uh, Anna's wish to find the people, to find the family. Um, I contacted Erika Nimis and then she made a call. No? And maybe you can explain a little bit about this uh, Nigerian project and everything. Absolutely, thank you. Um, uh, when we talk about the parameter of what we can do and what we can't do and the, the, the ethics of the situation, we also have to remember that the current custodian of this current archive, uh, of the archive is Anna Biongas. And Anna has established that she does not want to keep the material with her in Barcelona. She is interested in returning it. And that is um, a very important um, 
um, pillar of in our decision making. And this is an archive that has been in a family collection for 50 years. And this is, um, and we have been public about our, um, about our interest in locating the family. We've actually, it's almost like chasing a, a vapor where we think they're close, then it just like disappears. We've tracked the family name, people related, living in the UK. And um, one of the interesting things that are, um, that we are thinking about um, in terms of the research around this, it's not necessarily just the endpoints where we locate the family and we have the material back, but how can we spark another way of learning and thinking about this quest? And so we've, um, we're commissioning three photographers and we've given them the brief and the map and the visual landscape to go and track and create a sort of story around my journey searching for um, Prince Imarol Oyenuga and his family. So these photographers are going to create a very personal documentary narrative about their quest to locate the family. And um, um, I think that's also another interesting aspect to it. And hopefully Anna is going to tell us a little bit of a story because there's a lot that we haven't been able to fit into this talk around the character of Prince Yanuga, the film that he made, uh, the three hour um, film documentary he made in Barcelona back in the 60s, um, the, the way uh, the archive and the letters tell a very personal story about the Nigeria Civil War that is much suppressed today. And it's, um, that for those who follow the news in Nigeria right now, we'll know that the, the tensions in the country today really relate to the unresolved issues around the, uh, the Nigeria Civil War and, um, and the agitation and the problems and the tension in the country right now all come back to the fact that these issues have not been ventilated and discussed and, um, and have been sort of swept under the carpet. And so um, the archive really is able to expose and, and and bring to life some of these stories. And I think that um, um, keeping these in mind, the fact that we have to return this thing, the fact that we've actually contacted the Lagos state um, government about this archive, and they're super interested in what we find and in the learning and supporting the public um, 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 presentation of the work. Maybe this is where we need the the skill and the invention and the inventiveness of some of the photographers that we will be talking to over the next few about a way to maybe um, fictionalize this archive to bring it to life and um, maybe also reject some of the things that we find to be problematic and also bring in some of the things that we find to be interesting i mean it's always the case about archive you do not you cannot keep everything it's always about these decisions that we make and what are the parameters that guide us making these decisions and we have to think again futuristically as a culture and our uh, knowledge involves with the passing of time how we have to think over the long duration of time how will we be seen um, how will it be read in 20, 30, 40 years time when people reflect on the activities that we, um, we engage with right now? So it's really important that we create clear parameters and guidelines for what we do so that, you know, our actions are sort of, you know, are above board and defensible. And that would be my um, sort of feeling about this right now. Again, if anyone has questions, please write them in the chat box so we can, um, we'd be happy to respond. Wonderful. Should I, shall we start some questions then? Right on time. Love it. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so Zoe has a question. And just a, yeah, a reminder, please do put your uh, questions or comments into the Q&A box. Zoe has asked, um, I'm interested in what your plan would be if you suddenly found family members, what conversations would uh, happen amongst yourselves and with the family? I suppose um, 
Anna would be invited into that conversation because it depends on again who we meet in the family. Would it be the son or the daughter? Um, would it be um, grandchildren? It all depends on on the 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 concept with the the relationship with the with the Prince Yanuga and how much they care because custodianship curating the work that we do comes down to the word care and that is really the crux of the matter we care because we care about visual culture but they might care for other reasons so it's finding that um you know what we call agenda setting where all of our interests align and then we're able to find a way to um to ventilate or to present or to um, represent the situation. So it's not a simple answer. No, I, I think that it would be wonderful if we could find uh, somebody from the family. And we were really good friends with, with uh, Emmanuel and his wife. Uh, I remember them, they were a little older than me and my brother, but maybe they ha they were four years older, but we were young people in that moment. We were all students and my mother was the mother of all of us. This is why at home we were uh, talking uh, about uh, so many things of, of what happened here in Spain or what, or what happened in Nigeria. And uh, Emmanuel, he was talking to us about uh, the people who were walking uh, through the walls and say, and uh, um, about uh, very special, uh, things, mysterious things that they were doing after uh, a, a, a pandemia. They had a pandemia. I don't know what kind of pandemia. And after that, they, they went, uh, all the family with the father of, of, uh, of Emmanuel to the, to the seashore. And, and they had with two heads, two uh, of a young man and a young woman to throw it uh, into the ocean. And this was maybe to keep the, the spirits in peace. So uh, this was very strange for us and very exciting. Uh, so um, if, if we could find them, we can tell so many stories of, of these people in when they were in Spain. They, uh, they were living in a very, very uh, humble situation. Uh, they didn't have uh, enough money to pay even the, 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 the pension where they were staying. Uh, the wife was working in a, as a hairdresser and he was uh, working for an architect who was, uh, who was uh, taking care of the, of the buildings of uh, Antonio Gaudí. And because he was an artist, uh, uh, Emmanuel was an artist and he was really doing a good job with the, with the iron, uh, doors of the of the houses of Dali of Gaudi. Wow. So let's see. Let's yeah. See. <laughs> Thank you, Anna. Um, I have another question, and I'm also inviting Pauline to come back if, if Pauline would like to. I'm sure Pauline might have a question as well. Um, you. Well, I'd love. I I have many questions, but I'd love. I see many good questions here in the chat box. So please, yeah, prioritize those, and then maybe right, I'll come right. back with another one. Thank um, you. A uh, question here from Bruce, the concept of public ownership of these found collections, found collections I see as colonial appropriation. How can the ownership of these extraordinary finds be catalogued and managed and preserved to cover the sensitivities involved? 
I'm not sure if maybe Moritz or Azu, any thoughts on, on that? Um, first of all, um, the, the custodian of the archive, uh, as I explained earlier, is Anna. It was left in her care. And, um, and Anna has done what she sees to be the, the responsible thing and located someone who works in photography because the, and, um, and contacted me, that is that person. And um, we are not interested in ownership of the images or ownership of the rights or in um, selling or commercializing any aspects of the work. We're not, uh, this isn't uh, an extraction economy situation or we're not appropriating or trying to own. What we feel that we can achieve is um, create several layers of visual storytelling. I also feel like if some of the images, um, the quality of the studio photographs are as good as any that I've seen, whether it's Sari Sanle, um, Mama Cafet, or any of the, of the champions, I also begin to understand the role of, um, of um, breaking the hierarchies around inherited typologies and ethnos around object photography in Africa, you know, and the way ethnology and sociology and anthropology all conflict in that shaping of museology and on the continent. Because today, the biggest urgent thing that we're all talking about is future museology. What is the future of museums and how do these heavy institutions break down their incredible weight, weightiness to become a little bit more nimble? And how does an institution like um, a Magnum, for example, which you could call it a museum, how does it become a little bit more nimble and more um, uh, representative of contemporary society and diversity of society to be able to tell these stories? This is what we're hoping to achieve through this uh, project. We do not, we're not trying to um, own any of these things. Again, we've highlighted the problems we want to handle the case with a lot of sensitivity till the very last minute we will keep tracking and looking uh, keep searching for the family and family members as i say we have we even put it out on a very public platform called the nigeria nostalgia project which is quite a famous pop facebook page where a lot of people sort of you know share images around the history of the country and this sort of thing and people really go out there and want to learn about um, the past but we have received nothing today so um we will be we'll keep it all in mind we we're documenting the steps that we're taking we're documenting the 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 possibilities and the problematics as well we want to make sure that we're conscious of all of these as we develop this the 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 idea of the presentation or the style of his presentation. Yeah, if uh, there's little to add, I think um, um, it's been very well explained that um, this was a suitcase left by somebody from Nigeria that then went to the UK and was left in Barcelona. And I think any of these factors, you could change the nationality. It could be somebody from Russia that goes to the US and leaves it in the UK. And I think the situation would still be the same. Um, that would be my first um, intuition. Of course, we have to question that because it is, you know, in the, with the whole discussion of restitution of so many things that were stolen from Africa, it kind of you know, becomes a bigger context and we have to take, at least think about very carefully about you know, these issues, if it, if it really is the same, if it really was the same, uh, if it was the other way around, if uh, somebody from Barcelona had left his suitcase in Nigeria before he went to Brazil. Um, so I think we should be you know, thankful for Bruce's question, but I don't think it has, you know, like we have to be uh, more careful than uh, just to think it over together with many, many other things and discuss it openly and uh, reflect on it and um, try to not break anything, uh, but to make uh, it possible to always have the control set button. And if we 
look at something uh, the wrong way or this, that we can still fix it. So we have to, maybe uh, the way we are, we are talking about this in a very you know, private um, and uh, kind of um, surprising way, you know, because we, are all, we were all so, so surprised and we are st every time we open an, a new letter or we've opened all of them now in photograph, but every time that we read parts of these texts and we look at the photographs again, we are astonished and, um, and we, are, we want to keep this kind of, not childish, but um, um, childlike, um, let's say this kind of uh, possibility to look at this with a very fresh eye and as Carmen has called it an unpolluted archive. Um, but we are aware of the, of the problematics. It's not that we are not aware of the problem problematics, we just want to give it a, a very fresh reading uh, while we are still fresh at the material. I hope this also answers part of the question. That's great. Thank you, Moritz. I love love this uh, from Gloria. In case this, the suitcase leaves Spain towards the UK or Nigeria, would it be interesting to leave a kind of witness legacy of the suitcase's presence in Barcelona all these past years? That's a brilliant question, I think. Yeah. And this is the reason we have dragged Anna to every public conversation around the suitcase because we feel like, again, the thing that really intrigued me when I read, when I received the, I mean, several, if you've worked in a museum, you've only, you'll get a lot of letters, oh, I have this incredible thing, I want to donate it to the museum and that sort of thing. You get a lot of that. If you work in photography, you get a lot of that. But the thing that really intrigued me was the way and the style and the, of the letter it was simply it was short but it gave me uh, a feeling that the author Anna was really um, someone with a sort of artistic flair and really cared about this the situation it wasn't just like um, a vanity project and that really intrigued me and so um, um, we will do what we can to make sure that this is not um, the, the story is lost. The story is lost if it comes to Lagos, the the home where it works for over 50 years in Barcelona is super important in telling that story. We want to be respectful to Anna, her mom, who cared and befriended and supported Prita Yenuga um, as a student. I mean, there are so many stories around that, that we've heard from Anna. And um, now, you know, it, because of time, we cannot share, but a remarkable, remarkable man and um, his archive and his work really threatens the history of modern art in, in Nigeria. Thank you. Paulina, it looks like you had a question there. No, sorry, I was, uh, <laughs> I was thinking about the Mexican suitcase because all the story and Asia uh, hinted at the Mexican suitcase in her introduction, but there's something about when the material comes from, in the case of the Mexican suitcase, it came from, from Spain and France and then to Mexico and then to New York. And I remember I was not at ICP at the time, but there had been controversies. You know, why is the Mexican, why are those negatives that were found in Mexico City sent to New York? Why would they go to New York? You know, why are they not staying in Mexico? And the reason why it was that the Kappa archive was in New York City. It had been, you know, it was the heart of ICP. Cornel Kappa had founded ICP. And the basis of ICP was the, the CAP archive. And so hence, after many um, conversations between an art historian in Mexico City and Cornel Capa at ICP, it was decided that in fact, the negatives would be more, would be shared more easily if they were at ICP. And I think there's something here that's very important. So it's the sharing component of the archive. How do you then share, of course, with the family first and foremost, which is the, your priority, but also then with an audience that would understand and probably be moved by the story that is being told, the stories that are being told in the suitcase. Um, and I think that this is really what you work, when you work in an archive, one of the priorities is to bring that to light and to life, right? It is, there's something about the suitcase, it's closed. It could remain invisible forever if somebody like you all was not there to open it and be curious about it and respectful of it, the respectful of it, and then to decide, okay, I'm going to make an exhibition of it, you know, once everything is set 
everything is placed, everything is respectfully done. And when the Mexican suitcase started traveling, especially to the south of France and to Spain, as contact sheets, the exhibition was mostly contact sheets made from the negatives, it was incredibly moving, the reaction from the people who saw their grandparents, their great grandparents in the refugee camps in the south of France, in the photos of Capa, or the, you know, all of those photographs from the battles, from the morgues, you know, I mean, this was incredibly important for the people who could see the photographs and recognize the family. And I think as a photo historian, as, as an archives, you know, passion, being passionate about archives, I think that is what this is also a lot about. It is about, of course, the respect, the preservation and the documentation, but also about um, sharing, which is a big part of the legacy. Thank you, Pauline. Um, I think that uh, I'm very much in agreement with what you said. And what I wanted to add is, uh, I think that, of course, we respect Anna's decision to return the suitcase back and it's like the priority for all of us. But I think what we're trying to do like on another level is to understand what are the intentions what were the intentions of the artist? For example, when we talk about the Mexican suitcase and we talk about the found um, negatives by three photographers, even looking at them, we see that what we're, they were aiming to do is just to document the moment because they were even photographing each other. So this is like, yes, then this should be shared, of course, definitely. But Prince Emmanuel's story, and to get back to Bruce, Bruce's question and Moritz's comment, it's not about geography, boundaries, like political frontiers. I think it's more a story of an immigrant who could have been Russian, Italian, Nigerian. And what was he trying to achieve through his archive? Because he was basically making an archive of, should we just call it a personal one and not touch it at all? And how should we tell this story? Do we have the right to tell the story in which part of it? Because also looking at the material, we also see that some things like bad boy should be left as an anecdote, but uh, the, his practice as a photographer that he started in Barcelona, I started in Lagos and continued in um, uh, Barcelona is a very much interesting one. And this uh, leads us to the discussion of the studio photography as Azo has told about it, like very important uh, space for the reshaping of the identity in the middle of the century. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Azia. Yeah, um, it makes me think of as I as you as thank you so much for for telling that story. I love it. It's just incredible, um, and to hear all of the different uh, points of view and and perspectives on it. But just as I was as I was kind of looking at some of the objects, and I was thinking about you know it, it's very intimate as you as you say, also very banal. And I was thinking about. Um, the making of archives and what you know what um what things th those intimate banal things also then become fabric of uh how we understand society how we understand history and and who has and i guess that's coming back to the big you know one of the big questions that you're raising who is deciding which whose objects uh, become you know become history um any thoughts on that Carmen wanted to say something uh, mm. that was connected also to the Mexican suitcase because if I mm. remember correctly um, there were a lot of people who did not recognize any um, grandparents or anybody they knew on the photographs but it was just a, a chapter that was also very much unknown here in Spain um, you know what happened to these immigrant immigrants to France uh, and they were yeah left on that beach, uh, and and that was also, you know, uh, some. I think Carmen, you wanted to. I, I I thought maybe you wanted to also talk about that. It was not exactly related to that. It just came to my mind uh, talking about, um, yeah, um, who decide was to show and all of this and and 
also where, no? And also the question of um, that Anna, we have discussed a few times, um, what if Anna does, we don't find the, the, the family? What, what Anna will do with that, you know, with, with this archive that it landed in at her home and which is very, very important for her. And Anna was telling me she will leave it in Lagos, in some institution. No, that, that was a, a very important point also for Anna. And I think um, that is, is, a, is a point to, to, I mean, these photographs where if the family is not there, at least they should go to the place where they come from. And that was an important point for Anna, and, uh, and I just wanted to, to, to say about that. And pff, who decides what to show? I mean, I, myself personally, mm, find it very difficult yeah, to, to, to answer that. You know? It's too private, it's a family archive. And um, I think, and at least we should really try more or, or as much as we can to, to find them. And then if not, then it's the next question. Hmm? That's what I, I think. As a photo historian, I'm crazy about this material, of course. But <laughs> as uh, Maurice said, I put, uh, when we were doing the database, I call it and name it unpolluted database, because I mean, we just read off what was given, given to Anna in the photographs in the photographs, into the photographs, next to the photographs. We didn't intervene, we didn't put anything more than, we didn't pollute, not yet. And uh, so that's, that's also a statement from, of how we have worked and where we did stop. I think at some point, all of us got a little bit paralyzed with uh, what we do more, how to go. No? And all of us waiting, Emmanuel to show up and Elizabeth, but. Um, I think this is a very complex, complex, very complex uh, situation, and I don't know really. I don't have an answer at all. Yes, that. I love that, and I wonder, Pauline, if you have any thoughts on on that. It's making me think of the conversation that we'll be having with um, around Ernest Cole. Yeah, absolutely, and yeah, I I do love the idea that it that the suitcase would be at least uh, preserved in a space in Lagos where the material came from and where he came from. There's something there about, you know, it going back to, to that place. What was his relationship to Lagos, by the way? What was his relationship to Nigeria is another question because we see, I mean, including in the life of many Magnum photographers who fled, for instance, from Hungary or other countries that they didn't feel you know, welcome, even though it was their home. You know, what was his relationship to Nigeria? I was wondering. I suppose from the um, letters, we get the impression that he was in constant touch and he was almost maintaining a sort of like uh, correspondence with uh, relatives and friends who were affected somewhat by the civil war at the time. And he continued corresponding very, um, assiduously with these, with, uh, with his relatives and friends in Nigeria. So he maintained a strong relationship. And uh, of, of course, Anna tells a story about he, how he appeared, how he got to Barcelona. And, um, and I mean, we learned that he got picked up and uh, because he won a sort of like a scholarship. Um, and, um, and they knew him in the school of the, of the, the prince. <laughs> so uh, we we're doing a lot of research and we met with the institution, the school. It was hard to track his records because he did not get admitted into the very prestigious Escola Masana uh, through the normal routes. He came in um, through, as I say, through this uh, particular scholarship that we discovered. And the story keeps unfolding and we keep learning a little bit more about him people who were there at the time, his classmates, um, his lecturers, we, we, we catalog and are learning a lot more about his story as we go along. And in a few, in a week or so, or 10 days, something like that, um, we'll be in Barcelona to continue our research. Like the, it's really detective work, isn't it? 
It is. It is detective work. It, yeah, you uh, know, in French, the word curator is the same as um, policeman, commissaire. So it, it, it's very fitting. <laughs> and it's good, you know, I mean, I think the relationship to the homeland is uh, key also in terms of if you don't find family members, you know, should it be in Lagos, it sounds like it would totally make sense and that would be right. I mean, hopefully you will find someone who maybe hopefully with this talk will share as widely as possible and who knows, you know, maybe through the grapevine, but that, that you're, this is quite impressive, all the work that you are all doing to find the custodian i mean the how would you call that the ethical or moral custodian and while meanwhile the suitcase in foster care isn't it i mean it's it's quite beautiful yeah we we did actually just have from from carol thank you carol some some ideas of um some people that that she would love to connect you with um so i will send that to you directly thank you i love that that idea that maybe maybe together we can can contribute to that um, I'm just conscious of time. Do we have any final thoughts before we wrap up this conversation? Or is that a nice place? I would like to ask to everybody if they could help us to fight these people. Yes. Thank you, <laughs> so much. Well, Thank we you so much. Thank you so much. This is really an incredible story and definitely raised so many issues and answered quite a lot too. So we thank you all very much. Thank you. I do hope so. And the recording will be available and, and we'll be pushing that out. So more people will, will see it as well. Um, so yeah, so maybe we'll help get the word out. And that Carmen, way. you want to say something? Mm. Mm. I think Anna finished in the best possible way. But I only wanted to say that one of the most beautiful things of this project was meeting this team. It's great to work like this. Everybody oh. in <laughs> and has been really great. Thank you. So. Well, wonderful for us too. Beautiful. Thank you all so much for your work. And it's amazing to have you all here. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank, Thank you, Asia and Azu. And we will see you both tomorrow morning, a morning for me, afternoon for you. Yes. And I would just say before we before we wrap up, Azu, anything you wanted, just a reminder in terms of um and Azia, anything you wanted to say about Chi Yin and, and Wayne joining us tomorrow? Any threads to connect from our conversation today? So we we um that would be a really fascinating conversation because we're going to talk about institutions and the way institutions um what who the gatekeepers in institutions, who decides. What are the parameters? Um, uh, it's interesting because um, Wayne sits as the director of an institution, and um, Sim is coming in as a an inductee at Magnum. So it's almost like one person is bringing in content, and one person decides. We're going to have an interesting conversation about how those two um, collapse it and create a new timeline, if you like, and how those two collapse and create new meaning. And I think that's what archives are about, really, another making of archives. Who decides what comes into an institution? Who are the gatekeepers? Um, are we willing to have those difficult conversations around um, widening the scope so that um, organizations look like the rest of the world? So we're going to have those important conversations too. That's great. And that's at 2 o'clock um, British summertime. And so with that, I would just say thank you so much um, to everybody for joining us for the for the first event in this series. Um, the chapter two program and chapter three program you'll be seeing um, shortly and it is so incredibly exciting and thank you so much um, for joining us and thank you to all of our speakers tonight and it was fantastic to to see to see your work. Hope yeah, thank you. Thank you so much and to be continued. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.